All right, guys, so we have a big announcement. We, for the last two years in Pro Feedback, have officially reviewed and listened to and given feedback notes for over a thousand cues. In fact, we are basically around 1,300, 1,400 cues if you include me because I do a lot of monthly reviews and I did a lot of bonus reviews at the very beginning of our service. But I'm not the star of the show for this video. This is about these five gentlemen that you see here on the screen. And we're missing Scott. Scott, we're sorry you couldn't make it this morning. I'll try to get Scott on here for another interview. But Scott was obviously a very integral part of us getting past this milestone, a thousand tracks that we have reviewed. So in this video, I want to first just say thank you to you gentlemen here that are joining me and to Scott for making the service possible because literally this is your service, guys. Like if you guys couldn't do this, if you weren't available, if you weren't consistently showing up and providing this great feedback, Pro feedback wouldn't exist. I couldn't do any of this 100% on my own. It's too much of a workload. I don't have the ability or the bandwidth to really handle all of the requests that we get on the platform. So you guys are really sort of the grease on the wheels making this thing work and giving the really amazing value to all the members that are on our platform. So thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys. I know on behalf of all the members, they appreciate, appreciate you as well. But I wanted this video to be kind of a sort of summary of what we're noticing out there because if there's anybody on planet earth on the internet that's listened to enough sync licensing tracks to know what works and obviously more importantly what doesn't work it's the people that you're seeing on your screen right now so i wanted to just bring them on board uh, for a little bit of a chat to kind of pick their brains on what they're noticing that works and what are some rules or some guidelines that all of us should be aware of i'll certainly share my own um, so that you guys are better served in your sync licensing endeavors to make sure that your tracks are high quality and most importantly, licensable, not perfect. We don't worry about perfection. Obviously, we only want to make sure that our tracks are useful for people so that they can get those placements. So, Yele, let's start off with you. Um, what are some of the sort of guidelines, the common maybe mistakes or common successes that you're seeing in all the tracks that you've reviewed um, in your time with ProFeedback? Yeah, so basically the, the thing that I noticed with uh, tracks that I'm getting, getting uh, every week basically is that a lot of the orchestral works that uh, they sent to me, uh, they lack a little bit of realism. And I don't mean realism regarding the, the plugins or the samples that they're using, but more of the mixing choices they make. So when I get a track with an orchestral mock-up basically, uh, I noticed that are, there are a lot of dynamics missing. So they play the strings, for example, in one uh, volume at the same time, which sounds really, really, really uh, artificial. And so using some modulation like dynamics, uh, uh, for example, uh, um, yeah, in the plugin, you can use modulation or uh, volume controllers. Already playing a little bit around with that uh, can create some more realism. Uh, in the in the, the orchestral tracks that, that they're making. And another thing that I noticed is that they are using not enough reverb. So basically with rock tracks and that kind of stuff, you want to, well, be careful that you don't get this washed out sound. With orchestral music, you if you have an, I always say to the, the people I give feedback to, if you have an orchestra, you cannot record an orchestra in a bedroom. So there's not enough space about, for that. So when you record an orchestra, you are basically recording them in a big studio or a big hall, which has a lot of reverb as well. So try to, when you're mixing orchestral music, that's basically the tips I give them, try to make the obvious choice like panning uh, a string section, for example, uh, violin to the left, cello to the right. Uh, some reverb and basically those kinds of small changes can already really help making a track more realistic, but also more syncable. Great tips and uh, couldn't agree more with the tracks that I review as well. Strings, horns, orchestral elements are always a sticky point for a lot of producers. So absolutely taking that extra time effort to get some realism and some performance. Very great tip. Uh, Philip, how about you, man? I know you do you do a lot of rock reviews. You've done some country reviews. Um, what are some common things you've noticed that could be helpful for people watching? Um, well, one thing that I notice, um, especially in, in the rock and, you know, country world where there's live guitars and, and, um, uh, lead instruments is, you know, I'm always, um, saying the melodies should be singable. There's a lot of shredding going on, you know, with just, Hey, there's a new part and I can play this guitar and I'm just going to take it to the house and, and play as many notes as I can because it's fun and, and, you know, I'm a guitar player too. So I know it's fun just to like jam over your track, over your eight bars, 16 bars. But at the end of the day, 
when there's a dialogue going over top or a message for a commercial or something like that, and you've got Eddie Van Halen underneath it, then it's so distracting and it, it's going to get you passed on, you know, it's going to get your track passed on. And another thing that I, um, kind of more of a general note that I, I like to tell the, uh, producers that I'm reviewing is just use your ears. I mean, listen, there's a lot of, um, you know, quantizing issues or pocket issues where I call it the popcorn effect where everything is just, you know, landing at different times. And it just, it sounds, it can sound chaotic and just one little quantize and just massage it just a little bit where everything's hitting at the same time, just takes it from like a four to a nine immediately. Popcorn effect, dude, you got to trademark that. That is brilliant. Yeah. I love that. I've never thought about it. That's exactly what it is. It's popcorn popping all over the place. So yeah. great tips, man. Very, very helpful. Hans, I know you've also done a lot of orchestral. Um, you've done tension. You've done minimal music. What are some things you've noticed on the platform? Um, mostly for me, uh, was like uh, uh, it's, it's arrangement. It's uh, and the combination of uh, that the arrangement influences greatly the mix. Um, you know, due to the opportunity of putting instrument on top of instrument on top of instrument, uh, most of the times uh, you end up with a frequency uh, mashup. And um, so that that's that's a lot of times that's where I kind of say, you know, if you arrange it from the get go and see which instrument takes a certain part, a certain frequency part and, and stands for that. Um, then you don't have later on all this mess uh, uh, trying to mix it. Uh, so that's one thing. Another part for me uh, that that is always, you know, if I take out trailers, uh, is is the length of a piece. Uh, just keep it shortly above two minutes. That is in most cases absolutely enough. So when I get something that's three minutes forty and is meant for a reality show or something, you know, it's, it's, that, that just doesn't, doesn't work. There's too much. Most, most of the time, those are moments where I can already say there are two or three cues in one. Um, and then it's the, then the, another part would be for me, like the form overall, like, you know, look at your tempo, whatever it is and figure out how many bars you have within about two minutes, 10, and do your arrangement from there. Have a very short intro and uh, uh, you know a short outro, and that that should be or like a uh, you know like a like a good ending. That that should be it. Um, and one more point is the uh, it is it seems to be really hard for people to connect the emotions with a title. I don't know why that is, but uh, uh, it is really most of the pieces I get, they are titled in a way. And I'm, you know, I, I take I play the uh, um, music editor game. I'm like, I have no idea. I just go by the name and think, OK, that name, I, I need something that sounds like that. And in 90 percent, it's not the case. So so take time to listen to your music and then find a name that is suitable, that really expresses it uh, uh, instantly. That's, that's, that's um, most very me, helpful yeah. because yeah, all the work that gets put into this music and then at the very end slapping a generic label that's not even connected to the music is such a disservice to all that work you just did. And it's not, we're not asking for hours and hours of extra work. This is about five minutes of brainstorming and maybe coming up with a couple of ideas and then even testing it with maybe some friends or even people, you know, in pro feedback or in sync Academy or somebody to say, does this title match this music that's great great advice man really really well said um trevor chat do you GPT have any... there what's that let's <laughs> say so use chat gpt a little more with uh, your track <laughs> titles it can actually be helpful in some ways um you've got a little bit of a, a a heavy hand with hip-hop with your catalog and what you've been doing do you have any tips maybe for the hip-hop producers out there in terms of some common mistakes or some things they need to know about to make sure their tracks are ready yeah um the main one and this is true for most contemporary for some reason um and even orchestral stuff, but mostly contemporary stuff, hip hop, pop, you know, all that kind of stuff. EDM is repeti uh, repetitiveness, uh, especially in your main melody. It's almost like, like you fell in love with a thing, like a dun 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 dun, 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 dun and you just like keep it like that the whole time, and then you change everything around it the whole t like throughout the song. And I'm still constantly hearing dun 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 dun, dun over and over and over and over again, and like yes i can tell you 
pulled a hi-hat out or you brought in a new thing and then you pulled it back out. I hear all that stuff changing, but I'm not feeling like the song is changing because I'm just constantly hearing dun 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 dun, dun right, over and over again. So that like behavior really needs to change because I, I, I notice it just quickly and I know editors do too, where like editors aren't sitting around being like, Oh, it is a different section because the hi-hat came out. Like, no, they're just like, <laughs> this song isn't changing like this. And then they just move on. Right. Yeah. I like you like musical changes with the same elements you have is, is something that you already have is something that I think people need to do a lot more of because I, I, I hear plenty of times where it's dun, 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 right with the strings, but then you'll just remove the strings and then bring in a new sound. And then it's like, okay, well, you, that's not, a, I mean, that is a change, but I'm not like, I don't feel like I'm in the same song still. Like it's just, it, instead of just keeping what you have in the song and then changing throughout the song, the, the melodies or the patterns, right? Like if you're going dun, 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 the whole time. And then you go to a B section where it's like, dun, 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 dun right. Or however, right. You're still using all the same sounds, but you're just musically changing the progression of the song. Uh, that needs to happen a lot more than it does. Great points. Yeah. And easier said than done. Cause I think a lot of this comes down to just trial and error, right? Some of us might have a little bit more of an ear for how to create that continuity without being repetitive. It's like this weird, very hard balance sometimes to balance, to, 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 to get like accomplished, but that's hopefully what we're doing for the members of pro feedback is telling them this is where this is getting too loopy. This is where this is getting too repetitive, or this is where a change feels schizophrenic, where you went from one idea and emotion to a completely different, like you guys were talking about with the multiple cues. So yeah, so that's, and I think a lot of what we do probably in pro feedback is ear training, right? Because some people don't maybe have that innate just ability yet. And we were just talking about that, how if we all listen to our tracks from three, five, 10 years ago, we'd all be embarrassed because our ears were at a completely different level in our, our training and our evolution, right? So as you just keep making music and keep getting professional feedback, the goal and the hope is, and we're gonna talk about some of those success stories, is that you can start to see and start to train your ears to start noticing, ooh, that's that's something I shouldn't do. That's what the old me was would have done. We're not doing that anymore. And we're trying to help you guys get that built in training for yourself. So eventually you don't need us. We don't want you to stay with us forever. We want you to get the training, get the ears up to par and then become your own reviewer. Essentially that's, that would be the ultimate goal for this. Uh, I'll say you, Mike, for, um, on, to piggyback on yeah. what he just said. Um, and then I have a comment and, after him on this too. And, go and going back to the listening thing, like in, in times when I'm, you know, I've worked on this a section and I love what's happening here. And then it's like, Oh crap. Now I got to go to the B section and basically start at zero and try to, make something cool that goes with the A section. And, and it's really easy just to start pushing buttons and, and just trying to jam that square peg in the circle hole, you know, but one thing that I find that has been really beneficial is to play my A section and then just sing or in my, you know, hum a melody, hum the next part, what I would want to have happen right there. If I was listening to this track on the radio or something like that. And a lot of times it helps me, kind of simplify my thought process. It's like, oh, okay, cool melody, or no, that sucks, but I need to make a different beat or something like that. And I've always thought if I could sing it or, you know, beatbox it with my mouth or whatever it is, then I kind of have a template and then I can go to the keyboard and to my computer and try to replicate that rather than just piling everything that I have in my library into this track and hope it works out. Yeah, Trevor, what up? Yeah, so there's this famous clip out there of um, the creators of South Park who um, they, they talk about story writing. And what they say is if your story is this and then this and then this and then this, you're going to get bored because there's no progression. You're just going from one thing to the other to the other. And that's not interesting. And that's true in your songwriting and your production. You need a be this because of this, this in spite of this, this as a result of this, right? And if you're moving your track with those transitions and that kind of thought process, and that process in mind, you're essentially writing a better story in your track, similar to like creative writing, where you're writing a better story, like in words or whatever. So like, I, I remember hearing that like years ago and thinking, oh, that can be really applied. And I say this to a lot of the students in um, pro feedback to try and get them to maybe have another idea of approaching the progression of their song, because it does feel like everybody's making this and then this, and then this, and then this 
button ending, <laughs> right? And then it just, then you don't really feel like you've gone anywhere in your track. Great points, guys. Yeah, and just asking that question, why is this part in this track, right? So if it's a tension section or it's a buildup, why is this here? Well, to provide some tension. And what needs to come up after a big buildup and a tension is a release of some sort, right? And so I, we definitely always do that where I'll hear a tension or a buildup section, and then it goes into another point of buildup or tension. And it's like, we didn't really resolve the first one. So now we're starting another one. So we're not really having these kind of like thoughtful questions and, and these mindful uh, considerations as we're composing. So absolutely. And Mike, um, I know we covered a lot here. Sorry, we might have taken all of your suggestions, but is there anything in the cracks there that you can maybe fill in for us? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, it's two things really. So the biggest thing for me is also uh, the arrangement and repetition. You know, I think uh, what I've noticed as well is um, it's a different thought process with sync. You know, so um, when you're writing music for records, or you're especially nowadays and you have to write like a, you know, you're writing a one and a half minute song for a TikTok video. What you want is repetition. You want that earworm to just like be in everybody's head. You just to, to sing along to. And then, um, you know, that's just, you know, that becomes the hook that everyone sings along to. It's, it's really easy and repetitive. That doesn't work in sync because we have to tell stories, you know, and where our music is as much telling a story to go along with the picture of the editor is taking that, taking our story to cut it up properly with uh, the picture and the story that the picture is trying to tell and all that kind of stuff too. So it's, it's a, it's a different thought process. And it's also, it's, it's kind of hard, you know, it's a little tricky, especially if you come from uh, the songwriting side, um, to try to find a way to keep that singular theme, because that's that's another thing I hear a lot, too, is like, OK, it's like, oh, I got to get my track to evolve. And the next thing you know, you have like 56 parts, um, you know, which can be broken up into like 56, like 30 second songs, which is great for commercials. But, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really work if you're trying to pitch tracks to a library and stuff like that, too. So it's trying to keep that thematic um, sort of continuity, but finding that way of how to evolve that and how to um you know how to how to make it not repetitive and not just by changing drum sounds and you know or changing you know making the melody just an octave higher at some points you know so with or orchestral music and cinematic music um you know one of the tricks is to like move that melody in between the different voicings of the different instruments you know so your melody may start with french horns and then may that same melody may be played in violins by the end of the track, you know, while your French horns are now doing something else. So that melody, that original melody now becomes a counter melody, you know, so those are ways that uh, the story can evolve. So, um, so that's, that's a big thing that I see. And then another thing too, is tracks just aren't loud enough, you know? So a lot of tracks that, that get sent my way um, are meant for either trailers or, you know, people are trying to go after trailers um, or their electronic music, you know, and both require massively, massively loud tracks, you know, like, and I'm talking, you know, go from minus six RMS or minus, you know, six LUFS minus four, you know, trailer music. If you really want to get attention, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're really pushing to like minus four, minus three, you know, which I know a lot of our classes and everything for the most part in sync, we tell everybody minus 10 is pretty good, but not when it comes to trailer music or, or electronic music, you know? So, and a lot of that comes back down to production. It's not about like adding, it's usually about taking away, you know, um, and playing with the frequencies and you get that loudness in your mix, not in the master. So, and I think that's, that's a lot of things that, that I'll hear where it's like, I'll be pushing students to like, you know, get it louder. And then, um, you know, and I just hear it's like, okay, they're just pushing into the limiter more, you know, so things are just distorting more. Um, and it's more a matter of like, no, you got to carve some frequencies around, like out in your mix. And it's not even just a mix. It also, you know, you almost have to arrange your tracks for loudness as well. So that's a whole different way of thinking for sync than it is for songwriting it's a whole different way of thinking when it comes to making trailer music as opposed to the rest of sync as well because trailer music and especially you know a lot of electronic music too it's not about the music itself it's about the sonics so um so yeah that those are kind of my tips that i've seen and that is why I selected these guys to be our pro feedback reviewers. You guys can tell from their answers that they know what they're talking about. They've got great insights and they're great also just 
coaches and educators as well, right? It's one thing to be great at this craft, but not be able to communicate it to people. They're both. They are very experienced and they're also really great at providing just helpful, um, actionable things that you guys can do with your tracks. So let's jump into the um, fun part of this, which is what are the difficult parts of this job, of what we do, of reviewing so much music consistently on a weekly basis, monthly basis. Um, I will definitely uh, be the most uh, honest and I will sort of take the burden off of the rest of you guys. Uh, some music we listen to on this platform is hard to get through, like extremely hard to get through. And, and I've noticed, because I've reviewed so much music through Sync My Music throughout the years, that bad music, just music that's poorly composed or mixed or mastered or whatever the issue is, is, it pisses me off. It actually gets me angry. My emotions get stirred up. I get mad at the composer. I get mad. I'm just being honest with you guys. I get mad at the person who sent it to me. I get mad at the genre. I get mad at everything. And I think, what are you doing here? Why is this even something that you thought was acceptable? I'll be honest. There's been a few, um, not tons, but there's been a few where I really have to bite my tongue. I have to say, okay, this is somebody who's trying. They're at the beginning of their career or the beginning of their sync uh, licensing journey. And they're just stabbing in the dark. And they're putting stuff up and nothing's quantized and nothing sometimes is in the same key, let alone the same genre or the same emotional mood. And it's just a big mess. But what I do always try to, that's, that to me I feel is the hardest part is staying positive in the face of such a just a train wreck, right? And trying to still in that kind of a mess, pick out something that I think maybe isn't great, but I can see, okay, I can see where you're trying to go. That is definitely something you should continue, continue leaning into, try to really go further, further, but this needs a complete rewrite. You're going to need to do a lot of work. You're probably going to need to get all new samples and sounds. You're going to need to kind of go to the basics of quantizing and making sure that things are on the same key. So I do point out all the things that need to be done and fixed. Um, but I do try to, you know, couch it between some, hopefully some positive. If I, if I can't find anything positive about the track, I try to say, well, this is where I think you could go with this. And this is definitely a positive direction for you to go. But just to be honest, sometimes those reviews during our, our monthly reviews, they are tough to get through. Um, but it's great when people start making improvements, and we'll talk about some of those stories. So um, I'll keep this as an open question. If any of you guys have something that you know maybe just doubles on what I just said or something else that's maybe challenging and difficult uh, about giving feedback, just chime in. I think yeah, um, um, similar uh, – sorry. Uh, go ahead. Everybody all at once, go. Yeah. Um, similar to what you said, Jesse, oh, um, <laughs> try to, you know, meet them where they are in their journey. And I don't want to be condescending to someone if, if I'm suggesting like parallel compression on something. And if they already know what that is, then, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you know, try to seem condescending and teach them something that they already know, as opposed to just saying, well, just put some on there and move on. Um, and also don't want to just be like, well, Hey, you put some parallel pressure on here. You can go YouTube that and move on. You know, sometimes I feel like that can be a little bit condescending. Um, but it's, I think it's just the balance of, of trying to meet them where they are in their journey. And if it's a beginner, then try to be encouraging. But at the same time, you know, when I was a beginner, I wanted someone and it was, it was Jesse to say, not your best work. Um, because of A, B, and C, you know, and I take that as fuel and, and say, you know, damn it, I, I thought this was cool, but I'm going to take that and I'm going to fix it and it's not going to happen again, as opposed to, you know, I've had students before, not necessarily in pro feedback, but where they're just like, well, this is the way I do it and that's just the way it is. And, you know, that's that's a very self-defeating um, attitude right there. But um, so anyway, yeah, not not trying to be too basic or too advanced for where the, where the student is. Yeah. For me, I, what I was going to say was just, um, I find it challenging when there are artists that are submitting stuff that want to make that flip over to licensing. Um, but why I feel, feel that's challenging for me is because some of the songs are really good, you know, and the things I don't know anything about the artists. So, um, all of my feedback and my reviews come from the foundation of how we, do sync here and what you know um how the tracks need to be uh for as if like you're going to a library you know and it's going to end up being underscore or background or something like that you know but 
there's you know that's not the only way to get a sync you know so like if you're an artist that has over a hundred thousand you know like two hundred thousand followers on spotify you know consistently putting you know you're you can get syncs that way just on relationships and you know it's not necessarily just on the quality or how syncable you know your your track is structured you know you can do it from you know from name alone so it, i find that challenging when i get those songs and it's like this is a really good song but i know like this isn't really structured for sync, you know? So, but I don't know who you are as an artist. So like, if you're, if you're, if you're going that route, you know, I mean, sometimes it might be the better advice just to be like, go lean into that, you know, and um, make that as big as possible and then get your syncs that way. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, unless if it's like, okay, well I write for this band, but on my own, now I want to be a composer for like some more cinematic stuff and do library work. That's a different story. But like, yeah, I just find it challenging whenever it's either a band or a songwriter that has like, that's like, Hey, I've got these great songs. Um, and I'm this established songwriter, but how do I, you know, I just want to make some more money. How do I do that? You know, and will this work in sync kind of thing? So great point, man. Anybody else? No, I can go. So, yeah, yeah. So well, I, was, I was trying to, so the, just to understand the question, this is like just things I've found frustrating or yes. hard to do it. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, one is when it's really obvious you're using some loop you pulled off the internet. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> I, and I can, and, and I can tell because one, it never changes. Um, and two, it usually just cuts off. Right. So there's not even like a tail or anything. Uh, and two, like, and this, uh, whatever I'm calling, I guess somebody out, I don't remember exactly who it was, but I remember in, in one of the, in, in a, uh, feedback asking for musical changes and then they like, they couldn't. So they, they added other things like what I said earlier, because that loop is just a thing they grabbed. And w when we're talking about sync and what I've talked about in the, in, in the first part of this conversation, like musical changes are important loops don't really let you do that and so it's really hard to use loops especially like melody loops and chord loops and stuff in a way that lets you progress throughout the song now there's i'm not saying never use loops there's there's, there's plenty of uses for loops but if like your main melody is that dun 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 dun, 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 dun or whatever but it's a loop and you can't like change anything then like no amount of feedback and me telling you to change anything is going to work because you just can't. Right. So that, that one is kind of a, a frustrating kind of deal. Um, and, and I get it. It's, you know, you, you liked the loop and you put it in there, but it's just, that one's frustrating. Cause it's like, I can't take you to the next step because it's literally impossible. You're just using an audio file from the internet. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I guess that, I mean, that's really the only one, the only other, kind of like most, most, well, I'll get into, I guess that, cause the next thing we're going to talk about is kind of success story. So, uh, but no, that's, that's probably my one frustration from them. My frustration for myself though. And I've thought about this a lot recently is me trying to express with just words on what to do sometimes is, is hard to do. Cause like, I know in my mind, if I could see your screen, I would say, Hey, right there. Right. But in words, I'm kind of trying to say that. And so like on my end of it, it's frustrating to try. And this is just a personal thing. This isn't the, uh, the, the, the composer's fault. This is the, it, what we're doing, um, is me trying to express what I'm getting across. Like, oh, this snare sounds like this and it needs to be more like this. And then I try to explain how you could get there, but unless like, it would be much easier if I just pointed at it and your DAW, it was like, just turn that part down or just cut that frequency out and then it would fix it. And that would be like that, but explaining it. And then when it comes back around, I almost feel bad. Cause when they come back around with like a follow-up, uh, and they're like, Hey, did I fix the snare? And I'm like, ah, no, you didn't. And I don't know how to get you to, by just telling you, you know, so that one's a little, that one's a more personal, like I'm uh, like the, the way we do things, like a, trying to figure out better practices of explaining and showing and stuff is something that, um, especially in the, in the next year, I want to try and get even better and better at. Sure, sure, so for sure. I guess, so I guess the uh, solution to Trevor's disdain for loops is uh, interpolation, Ben. <laughs> All you producers out there, replay any any loop you get off this place, replay it. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's it, complete. It. Dude, yeah. Which is, which is really the Why way not? to go, you know, so. <laughs> uh, Hans or Yelly, you guys have anything else you can add there? 
Uh, yeah, what what uh, what is frustrating for me a lot of times is um, the time delay uh, between um, you know alternative versions or the new versions. Sometimes you know, like in February, I might do a. a um, a pro feedback and then in october it's coming back and said I, i've done this i've done that <laughs> excuse me and i'm like i have no idea anymore what was and I have to go back and uh what what generally would be great if if there would be consistency i see also like people uh still trying out stuff which is okay in the beginning but i think once once we come into place, I, I would love it when people stay with with the theme. If they do tension, stay with that tension for for months and work with it, so that I can see uh, if also like if my suggestions actually really took fruit or if if it worked. You know, sometimes uh, uh, I do that and I I have no idea did that person you know did, did they do the changes or how does it sound right now. So that's sometimes a little frustrating. For sure, all the time break between the two, yeah, for sure. And Yale, anything else you can add? Yeah, for personal, for me, uh, the most challenging part is just to communicate in English. <laughs> because uh, I'm Dutch and I've uh, never had any English lessons whatsoever. So basically all the English words and grammar I, I basically know is from television and games. So trying to get the message across uh, can become uh, quite a challenge. And another thing is the, what's really challenging about giving feedback is the tracks that are really, really good. So if I have a track that's just killing it, then I need to make a 10 minute video and I cannot tell anything because it's just a great track. So that's also a, a, a difficult part of the feedback process. Um, and that basically ties into the next chapter that we are going to discuss about success stories as well. Yeah, and I do share that. I feel guilty when I hear a track and I have to say, sorry, you're not really getting your money's worth on this one because there's really nothing I can offer you other than the confirmation that I believe you're on the right track. This is working. And I do try to point out what's working about it and use it essentially as kind of like a shining example for everybody else on at least our monthly live calls. Guys, this is what we mean by keeping the listener's attention or this is what we mean by less is more or orchestral you know, um, attention to detail, all that kind of stuff. So you're absolutely right. So yeah, let's go ahead and finish up with a really positive side of this, which was what are some success stories that we have all experienced in pro feedback? Um, I'll go ahead and start off with mine. Hopefully I'm not, I know he's probably worked with many of you guys or some of you guys, hopefully I'm not taking yours. Um, but I do want to say, uh, Carlos, um, who was a hip hop kind of tension orchestral producer in the, um, in pro feedback has been a member, I think since the very beginning, if not, he goes back at least a year or so. So he's been one of our sort of OG members. And I know for many months, he constantly had mixes that were blown out. The low end was always distorted. His bass, anytime there was a bass and a kick drum together, forget it. The, the mix fell apart, crunchiness, distortion, it was horrible. And I kept on telling him, you got to keep looking at this. You got to keep looking at this. And finally, I gave him a sort of ultimatum. And I said, listen, I'm not going to review any more music. I'm literally going to cancel your membership if you do this again. Next time you submit to me, I want you to un take off all – because I knew it was his mastering. We had talked about it, and I said, I know it's your mastering. You need to take off all of your mastering plugins. You can have a limiter or something, but like literally just so that it's not clipping. But I don't want any compression. That's what I think I told him. No compression on your mastering chain at all anymore. I know that's what's causing this. The next track he submitted was way better, right? No lower end blowout, nothing happening on the low end that was horrible. Um, and the track was still plenty loud. I think he was one of these producers, and I'm, I fall victim to this, where we're so paranoid about our tracks being louder, so we're just constantly compressing and limiting, comp, you know, compressing and limiting, and to the point where the track starts to just get squashed and there's no more dynamics. So in one month, finally, when I gave him that ultimatum, like, problem fixed. And I said, this is where you need to just start baseline. Stop worrying about compression. Stop worrying about mastering, actually, altogether. Kind of what Hans was saying before, like, be mindful about how you're crafting your track first. So the mixing and mastering is just a breeze. It's a really easy process because you were thinking about it from the start. And now, as he's been progressing, we're basically helping him get a very, I, I definitely can hear it. He's got a very defined hip hop orchestral kind of hybrid sound that's definitely him. It's very dark, it's very intense, and it's got a hip hop flavor to it. And I keep telling him, this is where you wanna lean into, this is where you wanna keep going, and he's definitely getting better and better. And in fact, one of our last Sync Connect um, sessions that we had with one of the library CEOs, the library had a lot of very flattering 
positive things to say about his track. So I was like, okay, so this is just definitely working for him that he's basically taking our notes as a professional and he's making those adjustments. And it's so great. He actually showed up at Sync Up and it was really cool to finally meet him um, and just to see how much positivity, you know, he's getting from this kind of cool service. And I know you guys joining me here were definitely a big part of that as well. So um, how about you guys? Any particular individual success stories you can share off the top of your head? Yeah, uh, yeah, I had one. Uh, sorry. We keep talking over each <laughs> Everybody other. Everybody on the pool. I'm glad everybody's got something to say. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. Um, I, I'm pretty sure this guy's name is Wes. Uh, and I've reviewed several of his tracks, and he's always had good tones. It's, it's in the rock vein. Um, really good tones. Everything's really clear. And and I've, I've, um, suggested you know transitions that work um kind of cleaning up some melodies sometimes um so they're you know like i said before like in the rock vein it's real easy to get into shred fest you know um so kind of cleaning that up and he just keeps sending tracks that are are constantly just you know beating the other ones or he'll go take my notes and then send me the the second version and they're always um appropriately edited and and it you can tell that he's taking the notes and really applying them and and making his tr his track so much better and i think i thought of him earlier when maybe it was han said uh the titles don't necessarily match the the song or whatever but he sent me a track and i remember the title was called underground scum and before i even Play, hit play on the track i was like man with the title here i know what i'm wanting to hear and i'm going to stop if i don't hear it and immediately it sounded like a monster crawling out of the sewer i was just like yes that's whatever's about to happen you at least got me from the beginning from the title an editor is going to want to hear this if they see underground scum so really well done Yeah, I'm here to remind everybody again, uh, use ChatGPT for uh, creative ways to do titles. You literally say, write me creative titles and then put like your genre and whatever, whatever. And you'll get titles like Underground Scum and stuff. And yeah. <laughs> you could you could go the other way with that too. Start with the title and be like, all right, I guess that's what I'm writing today. <laughs> that's oh, free. Yeah. That is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I would like to call out uh, uh, Michael Lawrence, actually. Uh, so he's somebody over the past uh, year has just been um, really passionate about uh, trailer music, been wanting to write trailer music. Um, and trailer music is really, really fucking hard. <laughs> so and not everyone can, you know, not everyone can do it. And not everyone definitely can like, can stick with it because it's, it's really hard to do. Uh, from the compositional side to the arrangement side, and then all the way to definitely the production mix side. So, uh, you know, his tracks have been uh, steadily improving, um, you know, everywhere from, you know, starting with arrangements, you know, getting the three act structure down, uh, getting the, um, you know, um, the buildups down and everything. I'm hearing uh, many improvements with that. And then uh, his mixing has been uh, improving in that genre as well, like everywhere from, you know, first being too soft to um, being blown out, you know, not necessarily understanding how to get um, those louder mixes to where like kind of finding that that middle ground. So still a work in progress, but definitely um, over this past year, definitely made a lot of improvements, which is really good to see. Nice. Really cool. I've got a shout out to Chuck Wyke, who came, I think, uh, uh, about a uh, beginning of the year. Uh, and he wanted to do some uh, merengue Christmas music. <laughs> and I was like, I was honestly, I was not sure if that's a good idea. But, uh, you know, I listened to that. And um, because of there are some instruments, you know, that needed to be uh, sounding like real, like horns and stuff like this. And it wasn't happening in the beginning. And um, so I figured out, OK, here and are little things you can work on. Here's that. And the next one that I got was done really well and steadily improving. And he just uh, emailed me um, uh, yesterday 
and said, uh, uh, hey, man, thank you so much. I've got a, a contract with a library for a merengue Christmas album. And so I was really proud uh, and, and happy for him that that worked out. That's amazing, Hans. Wow, man. Good for you. Good for him. Really cool to hear that. And Yele, any success stories you can share with us? Yeah, I actually have two. Um, so I have two composers, Ben and Justin, and they have been absolutely killing it uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, and they basically also did orchestral music, trader music. Sometimes they just didn't, were not sure if they wanted to go into trader music, but I thought their music leaned to that more than just underscore orchestral music. And basically their arrangement was already fine and a couple of mixing things. And basically these are the composers that I, or the, the, the tracks that I mentioned are that are the most difficult to review because they're already so good. So I was thinking, how can I help these guys further? And um so ben basically i said to him your tracks are already good so just go out there find a library and he basically got a contract with really slow motion uh, a big trader company he got uh, a placement over there and justin i basically work for another trader company here in the netherlands called hunchback music um and i introduced him to the AR manager over there and now i also know that he released his first few tracks with them um and man that's basically what makes this entire platform so worthwhile you can see the success stories and you can see that you inspire people uh, to become the best that they can possibly be wow that's really generous of you man to extend that invitation so that's really cool i'm glad to hear that they're on their way now so really great man and trevor how about you man yeah man we're gonna start with carlos and end with carlos here because um that's that's my uh that would be my i guess I thought it was mostly my success story, but now I'm realizing that a lot of it is you too. But like, I did notice with Carlos that all of a sudden there was that change in like the blowout. And I remember being like, oh, cool. Like I, I had mentioned it a few times, but I didn't have like a solid solution except pointing it out. And then it just stopped. And so I was like, oh, I mean, that's something I said, but I think Jesse maybe got to him <laughs> a little more there than I did. But, um, but yeah, no, I, he's, I probably have reviewed more of his than anybody else's, um, in my like list of reviews that I've done. And I can, I for sure can see the change over, what is it? Maybe the last six months or so, maybe even more than that now, um, in his stuff, like, like just all the, it, it's, it's almost like watching a track like, 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 a, like things just slowly get better. It's so cool. Cause like, if you, if I think about like mentally where like one of the first tracks I ever heard from him, I was like, man, like I get this just red flags galore, right? Like no offense. Uh, but, um, and then over time I just watched as all those little red flags started. And there's still a few things. Like I just reviewed one of his like a week ago or a couple of days ago. And it, it, that musical change thing that we were talking, that I talked about earlier is kind of one of the things I'm working with him on and he's getting better for sure. But, but just watching him progress, like, oh, the mixing thing, this is an issue done fixed two two tracks in, you know, oh, now this is an issue where you're doing this thing and it's not really working. Boom. That's fixed. And so it's watching like slowly, like a piece, like they're like either a track or just kind of his style slowly morph into a more polished and um more licensable kind of style uh because uh, most of the time like it's not even what i find very interesting is it's applicable for him it's not one track like I'll, I'll get a new track but he'll fix stuff that was a problem in previous tracks which is a really good sign that it's not just him going well this track i'm pulling out that mistake but then i'm gonna go make that mistake again in another track that's not happening which is really cool and um and yeah so like and just watching his progression um through these feedbacks has been really really cool and and honestly i'm excited because i he was like not there at all and he's like almost there now and i'm like oh man just a few more tweaks and like he's he's there to like really just pump out really great stuff that's cool man and, and that's really a testament to carlos for being as hans was saying consistent like being the guy who shows 100%. up stays in his lane listens to what we're saying implements the changes realizes that it's not just about knobs it's about updating your ears updating your expectations of what your tracks can do 
So that's what was really cool about these stories. And it was one of the main reasons why we finally put together Pro Feedback. I wish we put this together when I first launched everything, but the idea didn't hit me yet. But I just, I'm always thinking about like if I were back in 2008, I'm just getting started in sync licensing. I'm just sending my music to my first library. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm completely stabbing in the dark. I don't know if it's good or not. I'm thinking it's good because it's my music, but I'm hearing other tracks and I'm like, eh, other tracks are doing something different or better than I think mine are doing. And I just think back then how useful it would have been to sort of have a little a coach or a guide or somebody just on my shoulder um, consistently just, you know, helping me along the way going like, all right, yeah, you're getting better here. Here's where you're still struggling. So we crafted this service, which basically gets you guys monthly reviews from any of the gentlemen here, including Scott. I'm really still sad that he didn't join us today. He couldn't join us today. But again, we'll, we'll try to get him on another time. But uh, for those of you in the platform, you guys all know Scott. He's a rock star. He's one of our great uh, reviewers as well. Um, but I, I just know how valuable it can be to have somebody once a month just take a listen to your tracks, get these guys anytime you want them. And then I come in and I do our live monthly reviews where you guys jump on a Zoom call with me. Um, and I think, I don't know about every single month, but most months, I would say 80% of the months that we've done it for the last two years, I've been able to get through every single track that gets submitted. So some of the months, if it's busy, we make sure that we prioritize those of you that have not gotten a review recently or ever before from me. So you guys go right to the start of the top of the list. But most of the months, we've got, you know, it's maybe eight or 10, 12 people max that show up for those things. So it's not a large number of people, actually, believe it or not. So we're usually able to get through everybody's track every single month. So essentially, if you guys join us with Pro Feedback, you can only almost guarantee you're going to be getting two track reviews every single month. One from these gentlemen on the screen, including Scott, and one from me during our live reviews. And that's what we hope you guys get out of this, is that you guys consistently show up, you take advantage of the service, and then you, like Trevor was saying, you go from somebody who might be struggling, making something that's not really licensable, maybe not even great, it's not that listenable yet, but sort of consistently showing up, getting that coach, being coachable, um, and then eventually getting to the point where your tracks are ready to start getting used and licensed with libraries and getting deals. You guys have heard that there are deal, deals and, and relationships that are getting built through this service as well. It's not the primary focus of what we're doing, but obviously it is a little side effect that can certainly happen um, if you guys join us. So, Yele, Philip, Hans, Trevor, Mike, and Scott, thank you guys so much. Seriously, from me to you guys, big heart, big hug. Um, you guys are making this possible. You guys are making this happen. So thank you guys for consistently showing up, being available, being uh, dedicated, and being um, just really, really amazing for this community. Everybody obviously appreciates you guys. If you guys want to learn about joining us in Sync uh, Pro Feedback, you guys can click on the link in the description box. You can learn more about what we're doing there. And here's to our next hundred or hundred, a uh, thousand, boy, I undersold ourselves, a thousand tracks that we're going to be doing in the next year or two. So I'm really excited about the service. I want to keep it going. Um, and I hope you guys keep, uh, keep along this uh, journey with us as well. So thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this interview and learned something about sync licensing tracks. And we'll catch you guys real soon.